Hi, everyone. Um, may as well get going here. We're at 12.01 at the hour. I'm Philip Awadella. I'm Dr. Philip Awadella. Um, I'm the National Scientific Director for CANPATH, um, and I'm also the Executive Director for the Ontario Health Study, and I'm joined today in our webinar with Vicki Kirsch, uh, Dr. Vicki Kirsch from the Ontario Health Study um, at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research as well. Um, just a couple of uh, quick housekeeping items for today. Uh, if you have any questions for us, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, the chat's been disabled, so you'll be able to submit questions, and we'll try to get to, to answering them at the end of this, um, at this, at the end of this webinar. Um, if we don't get to your question today, please reach out to CANPATH at info at canpath.ca. And for, research, for research, researchers sorry, interested in the data access, please contact access at canpath.ca. Uh, and we also invite you to connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, I want to begin with our land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee Indi uh, Indigenous peoples on which the Canpath National Coordinating Center at the University of New Toronto now stands. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy, Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. With CANPATH teams working across Canada from coast to coast, we also acknowledge the ancestral territories that are home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So uh, we're very excited to be giving you an update on our work with uh, the COVID-19 antibody study through the CANPATH activity. I think it's been almost a year since through this forum, we've given an update on what we've been doing with the antibody study. However, we've been given a number of presentations over the last 12 months through different forums as well. So we're excited about giving you a, a very detailed update of what we've discovered um, in the last uh, two years, in fact. Um, so I'm going to be starting off the presentation. I'll turn it over to Vicky uh, midway through the presentation, and I'm going to be starting off giving a giving a quick overview of CanPath, um, Canada's uh, largest population health research platform. Um, we've been working with CanPath since about 2008 and 2009 um, through a number of the activities that have been happening through the different regional province uh, cohorts and provinces. Um, it's a population health research platform built to assess the effect of genetics, behavior, family health, history, and environment on chronic diseases. Um, as you see here, CANPATH brings together seven cohorts from all 10 provinces, and the study is now hosted uh, at the University of Toronto and the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Um, one in 100 Canadians have consented to be part of CANPATH, meaning that 330,000 Canadians are now followed longitudinally. Here you've got a breakdown of how we've recruited these participants in each of the different provinces and regions. And so I'm not gonna go through all of the numbers here. Um, most of the baseline of this cohort has been recruited. We've been actively engaged with this cohort now with many longitudinal activities. Uh, we have the consent to follow these participants for the next 30 to 50 years. Um, Having said that, we still are in baseline recruitments in some regions of, the, of Canada as well, where we're recruiting participants in Manitoba and in Saskatchewan as well. So as you can see here, we're significant in terms of size um, and uh, I'm very uh, proud to be working with this excellent uh, leadership team, uh, including uh, uh, leaders in, uh, in health and, 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 and data research um, across Canada. Um, many, and, um, including also uh, our, our leadership um, here in Toronto, John McLaughlin co-leads uh, the CANPATH activity here with me at the University of Toronto as well. And I'm also very proud uh, of the work that this group um, that we have here, um, who I'm re referring to as the antibody study team, are, these are uh, uh, people, while we have had active engagement from all of the CANPATH uh, uh, people working uh, on this project, um, Kimberly Skeed, for example, um, was instrumental as one of our lead scientists in, in, uh, in orchestrating our, uh, one of the primary architects of this, of this research program. Um, and Ted Kanya, Jennifer Vina, Trina McDonald, Philippe Rouet, Jason Hicks, Kelly McDonald, Ellen Sweeney have been instrumental in developing much of the tools that we have been used, using here and in collecting information about COVID-19 in our antibody work. So, um, Getting right into the meat of it, uh, we initiated our activity um, 
in March of 2020. Um, and that's when we first launched our first COVID-19 questionnaire. And there we were trying to determine um, or capture information about population prevalence of COVID-19 with the aims of asking questions around understanding biological society and behavioral factors that affect susceptibility, and also determining socioeconomic and mental health and long-term health outcomes uh, of COVID-19 on the Canadian population. In March of 2021, um, we launched our antibody study uh, with funding from the CITF, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And that program uh, was, as I mentioned before, our real, our, 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 was enabled by our collection of dried blood spots uh, using mailed kits to participants uh, where we were able to get blood samples returned back to us and with our partners uh, in Toronto at Sinai, uh, capture information with regard to um, antibodies, seroconversion rates, um, the impact of uh, vaccination, and also the impact of, of infection uh, on seroconversion or seroprevalence. Um, in our first survey uh, that we launched in March of 2020, right at the beginning of the, uh, or began the development of and launched in, in, this, in the spring and summer of, of 2020, uh, we developed a questionnaire that was designed to align with other international efforts. And in that questionnaire, um, you, and you may have seen Vicky or I present on this already at the previous uh, uh, meetings, we've, we've captured information about COVID-19 test results, suspected infection symptoms, whether individuals are hospitalized, potential sources of exposure, um, impact of pandemic on, job, on things like job status, and also the impact of the pandemic on mental, emotional, social, and financial well-being. Over 100,000 participants returned that questionnaire to us where we captured all of this information from, from our participants. And we were able to um, follow up this survey with a second survey um, called our antibody study questionnaire, which we launched in March of 2021, which accompanied a lot of the information um, that we were captured, uh, sorry, a lot of the um, information that we captured through uh, blood tests um, and so those variables include that, that, that weren't included in the initial COVID-19 questionnaire, things like more detailed job classifications and impact of information on vaccines, what vaccines people were, were getting, how many vaccines people were getting, mixtures of vaccines, and you're going to be hearing about that information of those numbers from Vicky in a moment. Um, and then also, um, you'll be hearing also about um, antibodies. Um, funding comes from a number of important uh, resources, uh, specifically the Canadian Institute for Health Research, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada, and the, uh, through the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, um, which is supporting a lot of the work that you're going to be hearing. As I mentioned before, 100,000 participants were initially recruited into the program, th uh, th sorry, initially gave us information with regard to questionnaires, and from those 100,000 participants, we targeted uh, 20,000 participants with our follow-up surveys and to collect blood samples from those participants. And in fact, we're quite happy with the fact that over 27,000 participants have in fact returned information in that second questionnaire and also uh, provided blood spots. Uh, just a little bit more details here. The CRHR funded activity um, is, was to select or identify 3,000 participants for a three time point recruitment with regard to blood samples. Uh, the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force funding and PHAC funded activity, over 27,000 participants through that activity were capturing two time points with regard to blood spots and then antibody information as well. Uh, my last slide here before I turn this over to Vicky, just give you a quick uh, a state, of the, uh, state of the nation, if you like, with regard to uh, the coronavirus and the epidemic. Um, and on average, an average of 5,000 cases per day were reported in Canada in just the last week. Cases have decreased by 8% from the average two weeks ago. And you can see some of the figures here in our slides, in this particular slide here. While the new reported cases by day are coming down, they're still actually a little higher than um, some of our previous peaks, particularly our peaks even in, in 2020. But what's certainly come down is the number of deaths. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, due to COVID-19 as well. I'm not going to go through all of these statistics here because we want to get into now some of the important information that we've been able to capture. So Vicki, I'm going to turn this over to you and you could just tell me when to change slides. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, so I think what emerges from, from some of that previous data is that vaccinations and their associated immunity to the virus are, are really critical 
to our ability to function effectively as a society uh, moving forward. So our antibody study then centers around measuring immunity and specific um, objectives included um, analyzing serologic data that we collected so that we could answer questions such as, what is the antibody response following vaccination, following infection? Are there subgroups in whom the antibody res response is suboptimal? So people with chronic conditions such as cancer and we collected, um, you know, we asked people sort of an open-ended question as to what chronic conditions they had been diagnosed with recently or ever. Um, and if they were in current treatment. Um, we're looking at whether immune response varies according to vaccine factors, like the number of vaccine doses or the particular vaccine product um, that was received. And um, then I'll show you some data looking at risk factors for infection, particularly during the Omicron wave. That was when our, our number of cases really rose. We didn't have that many COVID cases um, over the course of the pandemic, but then that's really spiked over the last few months. And using some preliminary data, I'll show you some of our findings with regard to boosters and their effect on antibody levels and risk of inf infection. Next slide. The study population is 66% female, 34% um, male with representation across each of CANPATH's contributing cohorts. Participants range in age from 22 to 93, with about 20% under 55 and 30% over 70. 23% of participants had a history of cancer with four diagnosed since the start of the pandemic and some of whom were in active treatment. Next slide. We measured SARS-CoV-2 antibody levels from dried blood spots. And we measured three antibody levels, anti-receptor anti binding domain IgG, anti-spike, um, IgG and anti-nucleocapsid IgG. So the nucleocapsid protein is in the viral core and the outer surface of the virus includes the spike protein and the receptor binding domain, which is located within a particular part of the spike protein. And it allows and then it, it binds and then allows genomic RNA to enter the cytoplasm. Earlier work during the SARS outbreak suggested that the spike protein was a good target for immunity and vaccines were then designed accordingly. So anti-RBD and anti-S antibodies are markers of vaccination. Anti-S antibodies indicate natural infection and they provide a means to identify those who had COVID-19 even if they were asymptomatic or lack a confirmed diagnosis. But people with natural infection will also produce the anti-RBD and anti-S bodies in response to infection. Next. All um, RNA vir viruses mutate over time. Some mutate uh, more than others, and multiple variants have circulated globally, most notably Alpha, which was first detected in the UK, Delta, which emerged, emerged in India, Omicron was first detected in South Africa. Um, Omicron, we know, multiplies 70 times faster um, than Delta in the bronchi, but less, it's less severe than previous strains. There are 60 mutations compared to the ancestral uh, referent variant, 32 of which affect the spike protein, and many of those mutations had not been seen previously. So we don't actually have sequencing data on each of our COVID cases, but we're assuming that infection during specific time frames can be used as a proxy for the likely variant. So in estimating incidence of infection, we considered risk for SARS-CoV-2 um, during four periods. The first we're calling the, the mixed wild type uh, and alpha period, and that corresponds to January 11th, 2020 to April 4th. Then there's the alpha period corresponding to April 5th, um, from April 5th to, to June, 20, uh, June 27th. And 77% of cases uh, during that time frame were alpha. Then there's the delta period, June 28th to December 1st, 97% of cases were delta. And now we're in the Omicron period, December 22nd to now where 100% of cases are Omicron. So again, we're gonna assume infections during these timeframes were based on the predominant variant. Next slide. Our questionnaire was comprehensive and allowed us to assess the effect of various vaccine related exposures, including vaccination status, number of doses, time since last dose, um, and the particular product received. So Canada and others promoted a, a heterologous approach to vaccination. So we have some people who may have started with AstraZeneca, for example, and then switched over to an mRNA vaccine. And so we can look you know, specifically at antibody levels and risk of infections in those groups compared to others. 
Uh, the covariates that we also included in some of our models are age, sex, geographic region, calendar time, uh, influenza vaccination as a proxy for health behaviors, comorbidities, and uh, measures such as income, occupation, including whether someone was an essential worker, um, household size, and ethnicity. And the outcomes we considered were a positive COVID test. So this could be ascertained through either PCR testing, rapid antigen, rapid antigen testing, or antibody testing, and then self-reported hospitalizations. Dried blood spots are being collected from over 25,000 participants at two time points. And at each of these time points, participants complete a supporting questionnaire. Time point one is now complete for all the participants uh, from the various cohorts. And it ran from February to October, 2021. And we now have over 7,000 questionnaires completed for time point two with analysis of those corresponding dried blood spots underway. At time point one, 61% and 8% of the study population had received one and two doses, respectfully, um, res respectively. and uh, at time point two, 23% and 76% of the study population had received two and three doses, respectively. So through this study design, we've collected biospecimens at various points during the vaccine rollout, and so we have antibody measurements corresponding to these various levels of vaccination. You may have noted from these figures that we have a very highly vaccinated study population, possibly because participants were given qualitative results regarding the anal analysis of their blood. So they were told if they were seropositive or not, which perhaps is of particular interest to someone who's vaccinated. Data collected at time point two show that virtually everyone in our study population is fully vaccinated. So the gray is fully vaccinated, the yellow is boosted with less than half a percent un or partially, partially vaccinated. And by comparison in Canada, 85% of the population aged five and older is fully vaccinated and 56% of those 18 and older have had uh, the additional third dose. Next. Among those fully vaccinated with or without a booster, 79% received mRNA vaccines only. So that's Pfizer, Moderna, or a combination of the two. 21% received a regimen that included AstraZeneca. So 3% of the population received two doses of AstraZeneca, 18% received, 18 received a combination, AstraZeneca and mRNA, mRNA, and nobody received um, three doses of AstraZeneca. In terms of vaccine safety, participants reported reactions at the injection site and systemic reactions, which is shown on the bar chart. Uh, the systemic reactions include dizziness, aches, chills, headache, fever, fever, fatigue, but most reactions were mild to moderate, moderate with less than 0.2% indicating that they required hospitalization for their symptoms and 2.6% indicating that they contacted a healthcare provider about these symptoms. Next. Antibody levels are an important part of immun immunity after COVID uh, vaccination and after natural infection, uh, but they're not the only measure of immune function. Um, infections and vaccinations can also trigger B and T cell responses, but studies have tend to focus much more on antibodies because they're probably one of the easiest to measure and they're useful in understanding immunity. Unlike antibodies, which are responsible for preventing an infection, T cells are responsible for destroying cells that are already infected. And it's much, much more challenging to understand each individual's T cell response. So these are box plots where the dots depict antibody levels. Boxes represent the first quartile and the third quart quartile and the line represents the mean. On the left, the green and turquoise boxes, you have antibody levels among people who have immunity through both illness and vaccination. It's called hybrid immunity. And you can see that compared to those who've had two vaccine doses, the section in the middle, those with hybrid immunity generated higher antibody levels. Among those who received two vaccine doses, mRNA vaccines generated higher mean levels than AstraZeneca, which was the Navy box. Heter heterologous dosing, a combination of AstraZeneca and mRNA, the red box plot induced a response comparable to mRNA regimens, the gray box. There's sort of a small apparent difference, but that's not statistically um, significant in adjusted models. The third dose, the pink, does in fact uh, boost antibody levels. Next. 
Here are our anti-spike antibody levels. The findings are similar to those for anti-RBD antibody levels, but for spike, there's less heterogeneity between people. So the interquartile range is much smaller. And while I haven't shown the data here, we, when we considered how different dosing intervals affect peak levels, after adjusting for time since vaccination, we didn't find dosing intervals to be significantly associated with the antibody levels. Next. These are antibody levels over time after a first, second, and third vaccine dose. And I think it's interesting to see the individual level data here because you really get a sense of how large the variation in antibody levels are from person to person. After a single dose, there are lots of people who didn't seroconvert. So their, their data points are below the orange dotted line, meaning that the antibody wasn't detectable. After the second dose, the vast majority seroconverted. And in multivariable models where we adjusted for age, sex, product type, time since dose and interval between doses, increasing time since second vaccine dose is associated with decreasing anti-RBD um, IgG levels. And that's the, the dark green line that's been fitted to the data there in the middle. The data for the third vaccine dose are sparse. We're still in the field and lab analyses are in progress. So we'll, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to fill that in uh, soon. Next. Again, findings here are similar for anti-spike antibody levels. Although after the second dose, there's a little less variation in levels from person to person. It's a sort of a little tighter around the line. And the rate of decline after the second dose is much more, much less pronounced than it was for anti-RBD levels. The biological re relevance, however, of the, dis dis the distinction between anti-RBD and anti-spike is, is not entirely clear. Here we have infection-induced antibody levels for each of the three antigens. And with the infection-induced response, antibody levels are quite heterogeneous. So in particular, there are lots of people who have very low anti-nucleocapsid antibody responses. The sensitivity of the anti-nucleocapsid antibody was only 40%. So that means that among those who reported, so this is based on self-report, so people reported that they'd had a positive COVID test, only 49% actually had detectable anti antibodies um, when we analyzed their blood sample. And it doesn't seem to be dependent on time since infection. So you can see when you look at the graph on the left that the, the, the dots are all sort of scattered evenly along the bottom. I mean, with increasing time, in, time from infection goes from zero on that axis, axis all the way up to 450 days. But um, you know there are people below the line all throughout. So even though there is a phenomenon called seroreversion, it's the opposite of seroconversion, where the amount of antibody in the serum decreases, that doesn't seem to be entirely what's happening uh, here. Even early on, people aren't seroconverting. Sensitivity was higher for anti-RBD and anti-S IgG at 78% and 91% respectively, and remains high for significant periods. Those second and those Second and third figures were restricted to unvaccinated participants because once people are vaccinated, you really can't distinguish easily between the source of the two antibodies. Um, and I think this illustrates that relying on anti-N IgG to measure infection-induced seroprevalence in, in, a, in a vaccinated population is challenging um, and that you might miss uh, some people who had na natural infection. Next. So we see in some of those previous charts how much variation there is between people, what accounts for some of the variation in antibody levels that we see. Um, age and sex are two of the variables accounting for that. So antibody levels decrease with increasing age, and this is consistent with uh, systematic reviews. Um, and here we see data um, grouped by age under 40 all the way to age greater than 70 years. And you can see that there's a, you know, a linear trend for both it's anti-RBD on the left and anti-spike on the right. And both of them seem to be decreasing with increasing age. We also found that females had higher IgG levels. And this again is also consistent with widely reported data um, showing enhanced immune responses in females. So sex differences like this might be hormone related. Testosterone is higher in men. Um, and naturally suppresses the immune system, whereas estrogen, which is higher in women, is known to amplify immune responses. Also, some genes that code for certain immune proteins are specific to the X chromosome, and this might explain um, increased immune acti activity in women. Next. 
What other factors account for some of this variation in antibody levels? Um, there are vaccine related factors. There's also a clear trend in increasing antibody le levels with increasing number of vaccine doses. So those are the yellow bars on the left. You can see uh, for both RBD and spike, they're clearly going up with one, two, and three doses. I mean, after one dose, one dose um, antibody levels were really, you could see that they were suboptimal and that's why these vaccine regimens were approved um, as two dose regimens. Among those who received two doses, the strongest antibody responses were elicited by full vaccination with Moderna. So here we're looking at the, the rust colored bar in the middle. Among those who received three doses though, the, the green bars, the, um, the product that you received was sort of less important and the differences you know, between the regimens became uh, were not statistically significant. And then finally, if you look at the blue bars, you can see that antibody levels decreased with increasing time since vaccination. Um, so we have two doses two months ago, two to three months ago, three, three to four, and all the way up to greater than six months ago, and, and antibody levels are declining. And the addition of a third dose then boosted levels to, to those even higher than the levels that were seen right after the second dose. Next. Seropositivity after full vaccination was particularly low among those with a hematological malignancy. So only um, 50% 50, 50 of those ever diagnosed seroconverted and 29% if they were recently diagnosed. We also saw suboptimal immune responses among those with melanoma, particularly if the diagnosis was recent. So only 25% of those individuals seroconverted. In multivariable models, we continue to see significantly lower antibody levels with a, a hematological malignancy. Seroprevalence estimates remain an essential measure of the extent of SARS-CoV-2 community spread, particularly now that Canada has sort of lost sight of the true size of its pandemic. Uh, the number of people infected with COVID is now somewhat of a mystery because uh, the highly infectious Omicron variant has really overwhelmed our testing capacity. Our most recent lab data reflects samples collected in December. And so our seroprevalence estimate is still low, 2.4% overall from February to December, with some variation over time, you can see that on the left, and some variation between regions. Although some of the, some of the samples collected you know, by month per region is the, the numbers get small and the confidence intervals get wide. But as more data come in, we expect this estimate, this 2.4 seroprevalence uh, estimate to increase um, significantly. Next. As the pandemic has spread throughout the world and the virus has mutated in multiple ways, symptoms associated with infection have changed. Among 51 participants who were diagnosed with COVID between January 2020 and April 4, and they're likely to have had the original wild type strain, Loss of smell and taste were common, um, and top symptoms included fatigue, general aches, and dry cough. Uh, some of them were often reported as severe. So you can see that there's a, a larger dark blue section when you compare to the alpha. Infection with alpha presented with fewer symptoms than they were likely to be mild, and they included fatigue, general aches, headache, shivering, um, dry cough. So about 50% of people reported uh, mild symptoms such as those. Next, so now comparing Delta and Omicron, there were a small number of infections associated with the Delta variant in our study, only 20. This, th th that time period, June to December, um, uh, was a time when incidence rates were low. It was, it was a summer and the fall and uh, our national rates were quite low during that period. Headaches, sore throat, runny nose, fever, fatigue were common, but mild. And in our most, our almost entirely vaccinated study population, Omicron, Omicron symptoms have been mild. So you do, see, you do see more medium blue in the middle section of the bar chart. Um, and these are the upper respiratory or cold-like symptoms such as runny nose, congestion, sore throat, headache, and fatigue. But of course, COVID affects different people uh, in different ways. Next. We assessed the risk of infection during the Omicron wave by occupation. So we, we collected data on all of these occupations and then even within these occupations, we have subcategories that can be investigated further. And as we have more Omicron cases accruing and greater study power, we'll be able to sort of refine some of these categories more. 
There was a suggestion of an increased risk among essential workers with a point estimate of 1.3, so a 30% increased risk, but it wasn't statistically significant. Retail workers, however, um, were 2.2 times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID during the current wave, and that was significant. In data not shown here in the pre-Omicron waves, we, we were seeing an increased risk of infection among airport workers and among essential workers. In terms of other risk factors for infection, the only variables that were significant were age and number of vaccine doses. Increasing age has been associated with a decreased risk of infection with Omicron. Those over 70 were 80% less likely to be infected compared to people under 40. And those 61 to 70 were 70% 70 less likely to be infected. And this is in line with national statistics indicating that there, there have been many more cases among younger people recently. We estimated vaccine effectiveness, which is defined as the percentage reduction in the hazard ratio. And our, in our study, the three dose vaccine effectiveness against infection relative to two doses was 61%. Um, and again, that's in line with some of the other data coming out of Ontario suggesting a 61% vaccine, vaccine efficacy against uh, symptomatic infection. As we collect more data from time point two, we'll be able to refine this further and look at vaccine effectiveness by time since third do dose to see if that's, you know, if, if it's holding up over time or if again, antibody levels aren't protecting us as time goes on. Or as the new, you know, we now have this new Omicron subvariant as that continues to take hold. Here is the cumulative risk of infection during four time periods, the four time periods that I defined earlier, corresponding to the dominant viral variant at the time. So there's overall, and then we're looking at the wild type or Wuhan period, alpha, delta, and Omicron. And it's obviously striking. You can see that the risk of infection with Omicron on the right is 23 times higher than the risk caused by the original wild type virus. Official published case counts, as you know, are an undermessed spot an underestimate of the true number of individuals with COVID since only those in the highest risk settings have been prioritized for molecular testing. Our data, however, includes not only self-reported PCR test results, but rapid antigen test results too. And we'll soon be able to incorporate results from our serology testing to capture asymptomatic and unconfirmed infections to give an, an even more accurate case count. We already see though, um, how important it is to include rapid antigen, antigen test results in the counts. So if we're looking at the source of a positive COVID test during the Omicron period, 42% were diagnosed through PCR, 56% rapid antigen, and 2% of our study participants ha had an antibody test outside of our study that indicated that they had been uh, infected. Next. The number of hospitalizations due to Omicron is low in our study population, uh, at just 36 so far. There's a little bit of a bias because perhaps people who are hospitalized won't be um, participating in our, in our study. We know that Omicron causes more infections and spreads faster than the, the original strain of the virus, but even if a variant causes less severe disease in general, an increase in the overall number of cases could cause an increase in hospital hospitalizations, which is what we've seen with Omicron and what we're seeing here. So the risk of hospitalization caused by Omicron was 1.7 times higher. So this isn't among those, in, those infected. And we know that among those infected, the risk of hospitalization is lower, the relative risk was 0.2, but this is just, you know, um, on, on a population level, has the risk of the hospitalization gone, gone up during the Omicron period, and it has. Next. And finally, using the complete data that we have from time point one. So time point, for time point one, all of our sero serology data are in and analyzed and could be incorporated into this analysis. We see that 49% of infections were ascertained through serology tests alone. Um, so at, when the serology tests are incorporated, the, the, we see that the risk of infection is two times higher than the rates that were ascertained through the positive COVID-19 tests alone. So, the le on the left, we have people who's reported that they'd had a po positive viral test. Um, and then on the right, we have people who had a positive viral test or had a positive nucleocapsid uh, antibody result, 
And then some people were testing, there was an overlap. They, they said that they had a positive test and they were also being detected through their serology. So 26% had a positive PCR, 25% had that overlap where they were both PCR and anti-N IgG positive, and 49% were anti-N um, IgG positive alone. So that's an important number. So that tells us that, you know, it was really important to incorporate the serology results. So almost half of the infections are being picked up just through the, our blood sample analysis, the, the PCR testing, the questionnaire data, it wasn't enough to capture the full extent of the case count. Um, and on our questionnaire, we asked, not only did we ask whether people were infected and the source of their testing, we also asked whether they thought that they had um, an unconfirmed COVID test. And it's unclear, you know, how reliable that information is. It's nice to compare that to the actual serology results to see um, if, if those people really did have an infection, and maybe that will change um, during the, I mean, during the Omicron period, it's particularly challenging because, because people are being told now to assume that they have COVID if they have the symptoms and to self-isolate. But um, among the people in the first wave, uh, when we would, who were detected through antibody testing, only 12% said that they'd suspected they had an undiagnosed infection. So, so, um, you know, a lot of the people, it's just that there were a lot of asymptomatic infections. And on top of that, 12% of the people who had a positive test reporting reported having no symptoms. So if you think back to those charts of symptoms that I chose, there were, there were a percentage of people who had no symptoms across the board. So taken together, um, we conclude that 49% of in infections are actually asymptomatic from the first uh, time point, and we'll repeat the, a similar analysis at time point two. Next. So these are some of the highlights of our findings. Uh, we emphasized critical age-dependent immune responses following vaccination with weaker responses in older people. Our data influenced some of the changing guidelines on AstraZeneca follow, um, and the importance of following it up with a second dose of an mRNA vaccine instead of another AstraZeneca vaccine. We showed that antibody responses elicited by an, uh, an mRNA vaccine were stronger. We showed that levels decrease with increasing time since second vaccine dose, and that booster shots increase antibody levels. We confirmed that antibody levels um, in individuals with previous infection elicited stronger antibody responses. And we showed that individuals with hematological malignancies had weaker vaccine-induced immune responses. And then with respect to um, our analyses on risk of infection, we showed that risk of infection with Omicron is 23 times higher than the wild type. 56% of current SARS-CoV-2 infections are diagnosed using rapid antigen tests. 49% of infections are asymptomatic and three vaccine doses reduce the risk of infection with Omicron by 61%. Next. It's one thing then to measure antibody levels as we've done. It's, it's another to measure how much they protect you against COVID. And that represents some of our future directions. I think everyone wants to know what the measurement that they need is and how well, the, how well they'll be protected. And there really aren't good correlates of protection yet, uh, but it's an important area of research. So right now it's not even approved. You can't sort of go into a lab and have your actual antibody levels quantified. You're just sort of told, a qualitative result, positive or negative. But a valid correlate of protection uh, would not only help with this information, it would also help expedite the evaluation and approval processes for new vaccines that are needed to meet global demand. It's challenging though, of course, because um, correlates of protection are also changing over time, changing with different variants, and that makes it hard to define you know, a particular cutoff for antibody levels above which we could confidently say that someone's protected from COVID. And then there are a couple of other analyses that I've uh, mentioned previously. And these are just a few of the unanswered questions. There's a wealth of CANPATH data still unexplored that we encourage other researchers to analyze. And um, I'll hand it over to Philip then to talk about accessing CANPATH data. Great, thanks a lot, Vicky. So um, uh, we're still in the field. Um, we're still in the field collecting uh, blood samples from our participants. Uh, from the great majority of our participants, we're just get, we're still capturing their second time point blood spots, and uh, as well, that will give us a, a better picture as to the impact and, um, if you like, legacy of the third of the booster shots 
with regard to antib antibody counts per participant. Um, and for some participants, we'll be asking them for a third blood spot, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, really quickly, um, just want to get into how you can get access to data that we've presented. Uh, CanPath has its portal, uh, portal.canpath.ca. You get a description there of the cohort, our regional cohorts, our, our data, biosamples, and how to get access to samples. Here's a real quick kind of screenshot, if you like, of what you can see with regard to, say, data. When you go to the CanPath website, it shows how to get to the core data, some of our high-level meta variables. Uh, other other variables that we haven't really talked about yet today, like environmental exposure information and genotype data and so on. And of course, uh, we have a process by which uh, research scientists can get access to the data that you've heard us talk about today as well uh, on that website as well. Um, we really quickly, this is the access process overview. Uh, we have uh, you know, we, we do have a process by which we we we, um, we support research scientists, and we tried. We, uh, and as Vicky mentioned before, we want the broader research community to have access to this data, use this data, and ask ask interesting questions from this data as well. Uh, we do have an expedited COVID nineteen data access process um, as well, and so you can see here that on average it takes about three days to to get to uh, uh, to get the data into your hands. Uh, and so uh, one thing we want to highlight as well is that much of the data, particularly from the first survey um, that we that I mentioned initially, um, is now available. That harmonized data set is now available um, uh, completely. And so you can uh, get access to that as part of the expedited review as well. I uh, want to again thank the National Coordinating Center um, at Toronto for CanPath, who have been critical uh, with regard to uh, everything that we've talked about with regard to the operations, the building the instruments and the collection of the data as well. Uh, so I particularly want to highlight uh, Kim Skate again, who supported much of the activity uh, through being not just being, you know, get, uh, uh, through getting the resources for the program, but also um, uh, building the program. Um, and Megan Fleming and Ted Kanya uh, for their work um, today for this seminar and Ted, of course, for his work in general with regard to the CanPath COVID-19 study. Um, I also want to thank the Ontario Health Study team as well, who've taken a large uh, a bulk of um, a lot of, of what we're doing nationally at the, with, with respect to collecting uh, the uh, questionnaire data. Um, so the informatics team was critical there and also taking the lead on building these surveys that we've been uh, using for our science as well. Uh, and of course, I want to thank the CanPath participants. Uh, this, of course, uh, is critical. Uh, their involvement, um, their consent, they're, they're, uh, they're wanting to re-engage and be part of this study. Uh, uh, it has been critical in, in the work that we've been talking about today. And of course, critical is the funding from our funders and the support from our host institutions as well. So that's what we have for today. I'm gonna to go straight to the Q&A. Um, and um, I haven't had a chance to look at these, so the Q&A is now starting to come in. Um, so I'm gonna probably be reading these as I see them. In the slide comparing the success of various numbers and brands of vaccines, um, two doses plus the booster are the best. Within those the three doses of vaccine, do you have information to share about the differences based on the brand variety of vaccines? Vicki, I'll turn that to one to you. No, so the numbers there are still um, quite small. So even though we have 7,000 questionnaires in, the corresponding lab data is just coming in so that uh, you know, the, the, the data corresponding to those who had three um, vaccine doses was still too small to stratify by product type, but, but we'll do that in the future. Okay, great. Thanks, Vicki. Um, I'm going to turn this next one to you as well. Can you comment on vaccinated individuals who are infected but may, not have, but may have low oops, uh, N antibody levels? Uh, not seroconverting due to body able to fight off infection. Using a threshold for N positivity may not be able to capture infection among vaccinated individuals. Well, I, I mean, if you look at the viral structure, I think of uh, COVID-19, the, the, the nuclear capsid is sort of shielded uh, on the inside of the virus. And it's not clear what the biological significance of having higher low levels of antibody levels, anti-N antibody levels. I mean, those people who've had prior infection will also have T and B cell responses that are going to kick in. And, and if we could properly measure, you know, anti-S and anti-RBD in those people, um, you know, I think that those, their, their anti-S and anti-RBD will be relatively much higher than the, just the vaccinated people too. It's just harder to separate it out um, once they've been vaccinated and, in, and infected. So I think it's just, it's, it's just a, not as good a correlate of immune protection 
but I think that they still do have enhanced, enhanced uh, immune protection, even if they're not testing positive for the NTN particularly. Thanks, Vicki. Um, I'll read off this next question, um, and I'll maybe start with an answer, and I'll turn it over to you as well. Um, if I'm understanding this presentation correctly, people with blood cancers have a lower protection from a variant, uh, should they be getting a second booster? So that is sort of the age-old question right now, where the discussions right now are, are around, should we be getting uh, a second booster or fourth shot, and who should we be potentially targeting there? Um, and so it might be very well, Laurel, that um, uh, if the sec if the uh, if the first booster is ineffective, then a second booster um, might uh, be either required or maybe ineffective at all. Um, so I think time will tell right now. I, we're not clear at this point whether they should be getting a second booster. Right now, we should we should probably be uh, erring on the side of being conservative and saying yes. Uh, we want to be um, uh, supporting. Uh, uh, their, their their immunity as much as we can. Vicky, I mean, I, I don't know if you have a, a, a comment there. Yes, I mean, this gets into some of the, the future analyses about seeing how well these antibody levels correlate with actual protection. Um, so is there a cutoff? What is the magic cutoff? Does it depend, does it, does it you know, are, are people who have, you know, hematological malignancies, for example, um, more susceptible to COVID because they have lower antibody responses or do they have other, you know, immune responses that are kicking in and maybe compensating. I think that that will all come in, you know, our future analyses on correlates of immune protection. Great. Um, this next question was uh, dried blood spots validated versus whole blood sampling. Um, and I'll quickly say yes. And this gives me an opportunity uh, to uh, acknowledge um, and Claude Gingras team at Sinai who developed a lot of these uh, zero, um, uh, zero conversion tests or antibody tests. And yes, they've done, they've done significant work in comparing dry blood spots versus say whole blood or blood samples, uh, venous blood draws, for example, as well. So uh, there are a number of publications actually from her team um, that uh, can provide uh, you with data if you're interested in the comparisons as well. Uh, someone named John McLaughlin has asked, even though hospitalization rate is low, could researchers access the data to discover factors associated with serious illness? Vicki, I'll forward that yes, one. Yes, I mean, absolutely. That's all part of the, that's all part of the data set, so sure. Um, I'm just going to check how we're doing here on time. Uh, we seem to be fine here. Can you, uh, I missed one here. Can you correlate antibody responses with risk of long COVID? Um, similarly, any correlations from other measurements, type of antibodies and level that could correlate with long COVID? So long COVID is, is an outcome that we're just ascertaining now. So it wasn't a question that we asked on uh, previous questionnaires. We hadn't asked if they still had lingering. Well, we, had, we asked if they had lingering sim symptoms, but we hadn't gotten into the details. Um, we are uh, launching a third time point, and on that time point, we're, we're asking about long COVID symptoms. And, and once those, it's sort of a little bit down the road, but uh, once those data come in, we will be able to look at the association between antibody levels and uh, long COVID. Um, the next question, can PATH data include antibody titers for researchers to analyze? A quick answer is yes. Um, Bart Harvey is asking how much is how much risk of Omicron infection how much is risk of Omicron infection decreased by two vaccines and one vaccine dose as compared to sixty one percent by three vaccine doses. So we didn't have in our study population by the time Omicron hit there was there was just I mean I think it's twenty there was nobody who had one vaccine dose it was just we couldn't look at the effect of one vaccine dose so it was. When I calculated the 61%, the, the two vaccine dose was actually the reference group. So it's, um, you know, it was a 61% reduction compared, uh, compared to, to two doses. And I did sort of try to further stratify the, the two doses by time since second dose, um, greater than six months ago as, as the reference group versus less than six months ago. And there wasn't a huge difference when the greater than six months ago was the reference group less than six months ago had some protection. I think it was zero point, the relative risk was 0 0.8 and then, or the percent reduction was eight, you know, 20%. And then it was more dramatic with the third dose. Thanks, Vicky. Um, the next question uh, is a reminder for me as well. Are there plans to have these preliminary findings available for participants to see? So we do report to our participants 
um, the, the results of the uh, the antibody tests. Um, so in part that might have uh, that might be encouraging as well, and why we're seeing such significantly high participation uh, participation rates in the study. Um, and as well, uh, the, this uh, this is the reminder part. Um, uh, the, this webinar has been recorded and we'll be hosting it on our website as well. And there will be a French version of the slides available to other uh, to research scientists as well. Um, what are the influences of other comorbidities other than cancer on your results? Thank you. So that hasn't really been fully explored yet. Um, you know, if there's a particular uh, disease outcome that you're interested, that's open for ex exploration by other researchers. Um, I've sort of focused on, on cancer uh, to date with, that, with maybe just an indicator variable for whether or not they, they were uh, immunosuppressed. Uh, how do you guys link surveys with individual lab tests? So the, the individual lab tests come back to us because it's a part of our research project here. So they are analyzed initially at, um, at Sinai and they are returned back to us. So that's all done internally um, here. And so we will be able to, again, that's part of the research activity. Um, so these are done, these aren't part of a, uh, a clinical lab. These are, uh, this is research lab results. And we just wanna uh, ensure that that's clear. Uh, do you share the questionnaires as well? Uh, the questionnaires itself are available. Um, they are available on the, both on our website. Um, data, uh, in terms of data, um, yes, they, that will be shared as well with regard to, um, in terms of, uh, even with the regard to that expedited access request that I just mentioned as well. Um, the, uh, did I catch all that? Um, uh, the questions disappeared. Um, from the, Vicky, this one's for me. From the hazard ratio, women are less likely to be infected than men. Does that, is that due to high immune response in women compared to men? Yes, yes. I didn't point that that uh, that finding out, but they they are in fact, and we can as assume that that's the result. I mean, I did try and adjust for other factors like age and vaccine product, um, and even things like we collected data on whether people were working from home um, and some preventive measures, and that didn't seem to explain the difference. So, I think that that's a fair assumption. Yes. Eleanor sent us a gentle reminder about communicating. Uh, are being consistent with our messaging in terms of doses versus boosters. And that's, that's certainly fair, particularly when we're thinking about moving into um, fourth shots as well. Um, let's, I'm just reading this next question. Is there an opportunity for CANPATH members who are also regular blood donors to allow CANPATH access to CBS data from donations? Perhaps a better question, would this be of value? So that is an interesting question. Um, we, we had this discussion uh, internally as well, uh, it would be, uh, it really comes down to one, how, what kind of information was collected from CBS um, such that we could potentially identify those individuals and link to them. Uh, we just started having those conversations. In fact, CBS reached out to us about a few weeks ago and we just haven't had a chance to get back to them about that. But that, does, that would be a way of growing and being larger than the sum of our parts. Um, is there an antibody level considered protective against infection? So I think we've talked a little bit about that. And I think that comes back to some of those questions about who should be, what is a necessary dose, or sorry, um, zero positivity level for there to be uh, um, protective. And we're still working and thinking about that as we, as we move forward. And you've heard Vicky talk about that as well. Are you hearing about any plans for administering do uh, dose number four, similar to Europe, uh, Malta, I think Israel was another region as well. Vicky, did you have any more? Uh, I haven't uh, heard much more beyond that. No, I mean, I've, I've, I've been reading some of the clinical trials for fourth doses. Um, they're just being done now during the Omicron period. Um, I, I, I haven't heard, no. And I think people want to hear about newborns whose mothers are fully vaccinated and safety. Do we have inf information there that we could relate back? No, we didn't collect data on, uh, on pregnancy. Right. Um, okay, and uh, one last comment before we sign off, and this is from Eleanor. Another comment, protection from infection versus severity of diseases in females versus males. More robust immune response in females may be associated with likelihood of hyperinflammation later in disease. That's certainly possible, yes. Vicki? Yeah, and I think that that would be an interesting research question. Once our data come in on long COVID, we can see um, we, we can see if there's an association there. I mean, and the other thing about, you know, looking at sort of risk factors for long COVID, there's also an opportunity to link these data to some administrative data holdings. 
um, if you're interested in that. And so if there's a particular long COVID outcome that somebody would want to study, you know, that we're open to sort of research applications that involve linking our data to some of the administrative data sets that are available in Ontario and, and in other provinces. And I will just mention, for those interested in long COVID, there was an interesting study by one of our sister cohorts, UK Biobank, uh, which published a piece in Nature, I think, on around 900 MRIs. Um, and there, um, they, they showed some, some interesting changes in brain uh, MRI patterns um, that they think might be associated with some long COVID uh, results. Um, again, very different kind of study than what we're talking about here today, but it, again, speaks to the value of population cohorts for these types of research as well. And I think we're at time, we're just a few minutes before one o'clock, so I want to thank Vicky for joining me on this call today, and I want to thank all of you uh, for for uh, for tuning in today and for your questions, and um, we're uh, uh, we'll we'll keep you posted about new updates uh, to the CanPath COVID nineteen study. So I want to thank again all of those uh, all, all the research scientists within CanPath who've helped enable this project and this study. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.